Welcome everyone tonight to our presentation. We're very excited to have you here. This is like part two in a conversation about SROs, school resource officers in the Wake County Public School System. Tonight we're having a conversation with the Education Justice Alliance. Um, I'm joined tonight by Lynn Edmonds. Uh, Lynn is the Outreach Coordinator, Director for not only Public Schools First NC, but also for uh, the local organization Great Schools in Wake. And she'll be serving with me tonight to moderate this discussion with the Education Justice Alliance. So let me tell you a little bit about our special guests. We're really proud to have them here tonight. Um, if my, there we go, Letha Mohammed and Fernando Martinez. Uh, Martinez. Um, let me just take a few minutes to introduce you uh, uh, to these two uh, very active community activists and two people who've been spending a tremendous amount of time working um, to take care of our children in this public school system and, and how they're treated and how they are uh, pushed out. And they're very interested in the school to prison pipeline. They've done a lot of work in this area. Uh, Letha is the director of the Education Justice Alliance based right here in Raleigh. She has been working to dismantle the school to prison uh, uh, pipeline. She has been working not only in Wake County public schools, but she also has worked across the state of North Carolina. So we're really proud to have her here. Uh, I won't read all the other things that she we could read tonight, but just know that um, she also brings to this conversation being a parent of three children. So that really gives her an insight, not just to the issues that are in, uh, to the research side of what's happening with our children, but her she has her own personal experiences and that's really important. She has served on many national committees like the National Dignity in Schools campaign and um, has also is a member of a local organization, Muslims for Social Justice, which has done a lot of work in the issue of school to prison pipeline. Um, next, I want to take a minute to introduce you to Fernando. And this is somebody who I've seen almost every couple, uh, twice a month for years. Uh, we're now social distancing, so I don't get to see him in person anymore, but he's been coming and attending the Wake County Public Schools school board meetings and special committee meetings for years as he has been working on this issue um, about school resource officers in uh, Wake County and in the state of North Carolina. He is the director of organizing for the North Carolina-based Education and Justice Alliance. He also has been a national field director for um, Dignities in Schools campaign. He moved here from El Salvador. Uh, he has had a long career, even though he looks very young, he has had a long decades career um, of being an organizer and working on social justice issues with a very strong interest in what happens to our children and the impact on their lives and on their education. Um, he also has worked um, in New Jersey where he did a lot of act, uh, active, activist work there, helping to make sure that we had new schools that the kids needed in their communities. So we have two people here who've done a tremendous amount of work in the area of looking at the school to prison pipeline and the criminalization process that has been going on with uh, many of our children, especially children um, in the black and brown community. So I'm really, um, we, we've invited them here tonight to talk a little bit about a new proposal they have been developing with other organizations um, in terms of the school resource officers. Before we turn to them for their presentation, Lynn is going to give us a little bit of an overview uh, about SROs, particularly um, in Wake County Public Schools. So just give me a second because my computer internet is running slow. But uh, Lynn, if you now, I'll give you a few minutes if you would like to just give us an overview to get started. Before I do that, a couple other things. I definitely want to thank Letha, you and Fernando for joining us and for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, we are definitely interested to hear your perspective um, and your experience on this topic. I'm going to review just a little bit of the material that we went over um, during our last webinar. 
And I want to let, if there's any audience members that were here for the last conversation, we had our chat was turned off and we didn't realize it until the webinar was over. Not tonight. We're going to make sure that chat is functioning properly and I'll be monitoring that and I'll try to um, capture your questions and we'll, as Yvonne said, we'll stop a few places during the webinar and um, try to get those questions answered for you. But we are going to pay more attention to that this time. I just want y'all to know that. So the first thing, um, just to review and acknowledge that, um, oh, and this is not on your screen, but we wanted to make a note of what North Carolina trains SROs to do. And we can debate whether or not this is effective, but what they're trained to do is um, play the role or be the role of a law enforcement officer, a law-related counselor, and law-related teachers for students. What is on your screen is an acknowledgement that there are some competing views on SROs. Um, one perspective is that they protect students, such as being able to intervene in fights, um, they can stop intruders that come onto school grounds and that they're there for as a security measure against um, school shootings. The other perspective is that they harm students by over-policing our black and brown students. They can often escalate incidents rather than de-escalate. They contribute to the school to prison pipeline and they make black and brown students feel less safe. And this is true among teachers, parents, and community members. So we just want to acknowledge that. Um, then we look, shift to the history of resource officers in WCPSS. And very briefly, uh, we started having them in our schools in 1993. That was before Columbine. By 96, local municipalities took over some of those responsibilities. And then in 2001, SROs were placed in middle schools in partnership with some of our local municipalities and the Wake County Sheriff's, Sheriff's Office. All right, and this is the last one before we turn the program over to Letha and uh, Fernando. Where are SROs located in WCPSS? Uh, they're pretty much in every middle and high school as you know, full time. We do have some elementary schools in Holly Springs and Apex that have SROs. And then there's about 75 SROs covering 75 of our total number of schools. And you can see the breakout there below. And thank you. I don't know who's going first, Letha or Fernando. It's me. I'm, I'm the person who is going to take him from here. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, can you, uh, if you don't mind, go to the next slide, please? And one of the reasons, and uh, when we got invited as well to this conversation, um, we thought that it was really important to uh, look at the history of uh, the placement of police officers in school settings um, in Wake County, right? Uh, in Wake County Public Schools, which I do appreciate Lynn walking us through that timeline. Uh, I believe that it was uh, the first Sheriff Baker in 1993 who actually was the, the pioneer in uh, creating these positions of pushing for these uh, school resource officers in Wake County Public Schools and then local municipalities took over. Um, but that was in early 1993, but uh, the placement actually of police officers in schools in the U.S. actually started way earlier than that. It started in 1953, which I believe one of the first, um, the first place that it was where they placed on, on a school resource officer or a police officer in the school building was in Flint, Michigan. Uh, and then basically expanded to other school districts such as, you know, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, Los Angeles and Miami and other school districts such as uh, New York City as well and Washington DC. Um, and we really want to make sure that we uh, look at this history of placement of police officers in the schools uh, under the context of uh, controlling and suppressing the uprisings and the organizing that have happened in this country in the resistance 
throughout history that, as you all know, the civil rights movement is a, a clear example of that. It has been led also, and uh, it has been key when young people have got involved. We want to make sure that we understand that the placement of those resource officers actually coincide with uprising and organizing by black and brown students in Wayne County Public Schools. Uh, in 1967 and 68, uh, we saw uh, the uprising and organizing and walkouts of black and Chicano students, right? And this went from uh, Philadelphia to Los Angeles. And that's where the like, placement of these resource officers of police and schools actually start um, the suppression of the organizing, the uprising that was happening. So we want to make sure that we understand the history of policing communities as well, right? And even the origins of uh, police officers, not so, uh, uh, the police officers uh, themselves, right? How they, they actually started, which was as the slave uh, catchers, the slave will run away. And also we want to make sure that we understand that uh, the government has also used police officers to uh, suppress and go after union organizers as well. So every time we do have an uprising, every time we do have uh, communities organizing to defend themselves or resist, we have been encountered in this country by the placement and increasing militarization of police officers. And this is no different of what happened on the streets in our communities for black and brown people, right? Uh, it's no different than to also what happened in the school building. So um, from there, we can actually see uh, the movement from the uprising and the walkout from the Chicano movement and black students, uh, also as well to the war on drugs, right? And this is very important to know because uh, this also increases, um, you know, the number of uh, people of color incarcerated. So uh, President Nixon and later President Richard, uh, President Richard Nixon and later President Reagan actually declared the war on drugs. Uh, and they started by putting $1.7 billion into police department, right? And also to demand the minimum sentencing. And this actually created a huge increase on, on the incarceration of, of black and brown people. But it wasn't until um, President Clinton, um, I gotta jump some of the slideshows because of the time, but but it wasn't until President Clinton when he actually uh, you know uh, created the, the the crime bill, right? The the, the gun free schools as well, uh, where they actually allocated billions and billions of dollars uh, to uh, militarize and create more police officers in the schools and in the communities and also in the schools, right? And that's how the cops programs was created as well and um the cut program i'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you are we on the slide where you want to be um, i'm actually skipping some slides because i want and i'm uh, mindful of the time okay no problem right now we are on the side i want to be thank you okay. uh, and the controls uh, so for us to understand the impact of uh police officers in the school building in black and brown families, including black and brown students, we must understand, we must take the time to understand the history of policing in the US um, and how this country has, uh, in the name of prevention, in the name of uh, crime, uh, prevention and reducing crime, has invested millions, I mean, billions and billions of dollars in militarizing uh, not only those communities with uh, uh, police officers, but also with uh, uh, our schools as well, right? Uh, we have seen that um, the creation of uh, the DARE program, who is supposed to be a program where uh, police officers were supposed to be in relationship with the students, right? Actually had negative impacts on the students um, as well, and doesn't necessarily prove that they were actually effective on, on preventing young people from trying drugs, right? But actually shows the opposite, that they were really negative uh, on black and brown students. So, and then following that, we know that, that the National uh, Resource Officer or NASRO actually start presenting um, the alternative to uh, the, the, the idea of police and schools 
as having police in a school that can actually be teachers, right? They can actually be informal counselors, right? That's how they have sell this idea of having police in the schools. Uh, but at the same time, we know that the police officers are sworn law enforcement by training. Some of them have military training. Um, and they do are, are trained to uh, do conduct themselves in a way that they're going to control the situation first. They're going to actually use violence that they're going to uh, force. They're going to use really force and violence when it's needed to control the situation, right? Uh, that's part of the training. The other part of the training is profiling. We do know that they, they are uh, trying to profile criminals. Um, and we do know that, you know, the, the training, uh, some of them call it implicit bias, some of them call it racism, right? But the training of police officers uh, definitely shows that police officers, whether they're placed in the school or outside of our communities, have high tendency and high actually numbers when it comes to um, labeling or identifying criminals as the people that are black and brown, right? Like we do know that that's, that's an issue in this country. Um, so we want to make sure that we understand that. Um, how the police, and the police and actually have work in our communities that actually have negative impacts. And then we start seeing all the programs uh, like the uh, 1023 program, which is basically allowing the, the, the Department of Defense to pass surplus guns or military grade weapons to some of the local police departments, right? Uh, and, and by that, uh, we mean that some police departments have gotten um, tanks have gotten uh, grenade launchers, have gotten helicopters, have gotten all kinds of military grade weapons that we no longer use in the war that we fight in, that that's a whole another conversation, uh, but actually are used on our citizens, on our communities, including some school police departments, because some school districts also have created their own school police department and we do know that some of them have, if I'm not mistaken, because Los Angeles Unified School Police Department returned the, 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 the military grade weapons about five years ago or four years ago. Uh, but I think that there is about more than 20 um, school police department that still have military grade weapons to the 1033 program. Uh, so we want to make sure that we see the context in which we are raising the awareness of the negative impacts or having police officers in the school building. And then if you don't mind, uh, can we move to the next slide of this? Uh, actually the next one, the very next one. We want to make sure that um, we also don't forget that uh, Lin was telling us the story, the history of uh, Putin police officers and Wake County public schools. Um, and we also want to make sure that between that time in 1993 to uh, 2009, there was no uh, memorandum of understanding between Wake County public schools. Uh, and they were basically being let free in the school building. Uh, there was no really arrangement of what they should be doing or not doing until 2009. Uh, and even then, when they uh, actually implemented Memorandum of Understanding, we do know that uh, for, um, because we look at the metrics, we look at the statistics, at the data, we do know that there was a period of time in which Wake County Public Schools was definitely overutilizing police officers to actually enforce the student code of conduct, right? And uh, we actually, at one point, another uh, organizing we can at one point look into uh, the, all the reasons why police officers press charges against the students in the juvenile and criminal court. And with the exception of drugs and guns, most of the other things that uh, school uh, police press charges against the students in juvenile and criminal court could have been dealt and resolved under the student code of conduct, right? So we do know that the Wake County School District has all this level of infractions and in, in all these multiple ways in which they can actually deal with the misbehavior of the students um, under the student code of conduct. But because we have police officers in the building, 
they choose to press charges against the students. And to give you more, uh, one specific example, right? I'm not gonna go through the whole timeline, but we know that in 2008, there were incidents of police officers already abusing their powers in Wake County school, uh, schools, uh, buildings. 2011, there were other cases um, against some students with special needs. But the 2014 case, right? Uh, with the case of Selena, uh, Selena Rodriguez, a foster student who um, got into a, a discipline fight in the bus uh, to, in the way to school. And then uh, the principal addressed that issue, that's misbehavior, and suspended this student for 10 days uh, because of the misbehavior. And she got into a fight with a white student. The white students were not, was not suspended, only the, the, the Latina students. Uh, but she was in the foster care system. So, uh, the very next day, the police officer, because we happened in the school building in the first place, he thought that the suspension wasn't punishment or wasn't enough punishment. So he actually, on his own, unilaterally, decided to file charges against this student. And she ended up being incarcerated for three weeks. The foster care system didn't have the capacity to find another house for this student because the family, when they found out that she was incarcerated, they didn't want it back, right? Uh, and we know that that happened just because this uh, uh, police officer decided that um, addressing this misbehavior under the student code of conduct wasn't punishing enough, so he needed to press charges against the student. And they actually, uh, that's, that's one of the extreme cases, but the point here is that uh, the consequences and the deep trauma uh, and that we are injecting on of our black and brown student is real because we have police officers in the first place. So some of the schools uh, have um, two police officers. Some of the high schools in Wayne County have two full-time police officers. And we do know that they only have one nurse that actually goes there one day a week. So we also want to make the point that you look into the ratio, right? And the priorities where they are. We can see that the school nurse has a ratio of uh, 1,752 students per nurse. But we do know that some of the police officers uh, is in this particular high school, uh, Ronisville, to be more specific, the student to police ratio is 1,100 uh, students per police officer. Um, so you can see also uh, the priorities of these uh, uh, of the schools, right? Uh, and you can actually look into the psychologists as well, where they have uh, almost one, uh, uh, almost uh, 1,850 1, students per one psychology in Wake County Public Schools. Um, and then the last one I want to make is that um, even though in Wake County the Black student population only makes the 20% of all the students. Uh, we know that they receive 73% of all the court referrals. And that is real. And we are actually uh, using the same data that they out of report, right? That the Wake County Public School report or collect from, from, from themselves and from these police officers. But I know of cases where they have not report this, right? In those particular schools. So it is my opinion that this data they actually report is underreported, right? It's underreported because they don't report all the single cases that uh, we hear of. So by those numbers, you can actually see the negative impacts on black and brown students uh, because we have police officers in the first place. Okay. The slide is for Lita. Yvonne, do you want to pause here for some questions? Uh, if we have a few questions that are just about the history of policing in Wake County Public Schools, that would be great. If not, uh, we can move on and let uh, Lita and Fernando talk about the proposal that they have put together with their partners. Do you see any questions that related uh, to, uh, to this issue of the history, Lynn? Anyone I have do. any questions? Raise your hand. I do. I want to know, um, you. Fernando, you talked about the military military weapons, um, like war type weapons that are found in some SRO departments and school districts. Is that true for WCPSS or is that national data? 
I, I should have been clear at the beginning that we wanted to provide a background and perspective of the militarization of the school and our communities at the national level, because you lean yeah. and look into the local data. Uh, we know for sure that Wake County Sheriff don't have, uh, they haven't received any weapons uh, because of the Dentity program. But we are making the point that this is happening in other school districts across the country. Sure, that's that's fine. I just want to be sure that we clarify for the audience because we are talking about SROs and WCPSS. And I just want us to distinguish what we mean at the national level or in other districts compared to Wake County. That's a very valid question. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else has made a comment here and I'll just read it because I think it's um, interesting. Uh, but they say that the North Carolina school psychologists have a ratio of about one per 2100. They're just kind of giving us a new data point here. Uh, students, but they have specific training in crisis management counseling um, techniques and social emotional learning. And that is a good uh, figure. We had one that was about tw almost 2300. So I think it's come down a little bit. So 2100 is a pretty significant uh, negative <laughs> statistics on its own. Uh, Lynn, do you have another question there? And, and, and to be fair, right? The number is about one psychologist for 1,850 students is in Wake County Public Schools. So oh. Wake County Public Schools are doing better than the, the, than the institution you cited uh, recently. Yeah. So Thank here you. I, I also just wanted to um, add a little perspective to the history. Um, Fernando talked about, um, you know, when police were first entered in school was, you know, in different parts of the country and it was around the civil rights movement when they're, and he used the term uprising, right? And I always want to ensure that, you know, our audience understands because for some people uprising can have a negative connotation, right? But for communities of color whose material conditions are one of um, facing racism or oppression and uprising is an uprising against change in the material conditions, right? And so during the civil rights movement, there were people who saw that, you know, on the other side of that from some negative perspective, but for the communities that were directly impacted by laws that weren't fairly um, placed, right? That negatively impacted black and brown communities, the the use or, or the, the need to push for changes that, uh, created a better outcome for our, not only within our schools, but in our communities in general, is just an example of what that uprising language actually means. I just wanted to ground us in that. It's a good thing. Yeah, I'm gonna say, say that we'll take a few more comments here because I really want you to have a lot of time to talk about your proposal. That's really important. But someone does have a quick question here. They were wondered, um, it says, uh, does anyone know if in um, middle school, if the SROs have um, a curriculum specific to middle school students, are there standards? Uh, do middle school SROs have a curriculum specific to them? Uh, so uh, it, you want to take answer that? Okay. Yeah. So I do know that in all of our middle schools in Wake County public schools, those school resource officers are all from our um, Wake County Sheriff's Department. So it's you know uniform across every middle school in Wake County, you're gonna have a Sheriff's Department uh, deputy. They don't have curriculum. So I want us to be clear about their role. They're not teachers, right? They're not, they're not um, employees of the district. They are Wake County Sheriff's Department employees so they're deputies so yeah they're they're working under the auspice of a deputy of the sheriff department so no there isn't a curriculum that they use within um the school system okay one more question before we move on because i think people would like to understand this foundation as you go into your proposal they're wondering if sros are allowed to speak with children without their parents present um and if you know, are being informed ahead of time. And um, so anyone want to answer that question on based on your research? Fernando, Fernando we, you're talking, but we can't hear you.
Letha, you're going to have to take that. Yeah. So I, I would say, um, so you will hear that, yes, they should, right? They're, that every attempt is going to be made, right? To um, talk to a parent before that interaction, but that isn't always what happens. Oftentimes it isn't what happens at all. So um, it may be something in writing, but in practice, I can't say I've heard otherwise. I've heard of, you know, different uh, circumstances. Yeah. And for me as a parent, that has always been troubling, right? Like that if you're interacting with a, um, a person that's a law enforcement official, then there should be me as a parent. I want to know. I want to be there, right? Because that that is, um, first off, for young people, that's just a um, a harrowing experience. It could be that for adults. So then you talk about a 13, 14, 15, 16 year old, right? What What's that power di dynamic like, right? And what could potentially go wrong in that kind of interaction? Okay, well, let's go ahead and pause now and get back to um, giving you an opportunity. Uh, we will not ignore, there's a couple more questions, but uh, we will not ignore them. Lynn's keeping track, but let's go ahead and give you an opportunity to talk about something that came out a, a couple of weeks ago, which is uh, very interesting. Um, so uh, I'll let you go ahead, whoever wants to kick that off. It'll be me, but I want to give uh, Fernando an opportunity just to say something so we can be in, uh, sure his okay. mic is working again. Can, can, okay. Can you receive me? Uh, we can hear you now. I think you addressed the, 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 the question already, but I just want to make sure that the people know that in the uh, Wake County School Policy 1742, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, no, 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 I'm trying to get back. It's the memorandum of understanding between Wake County Schools and the police officers. The language there suggests that uh, police officers should uh, uh, do not talk to the um, student without having, without first trying to contact the parents, but it's, it's not like if they, can, if they don't get in contact with the parents, they should talk to the student at least having one of the uh, adults, uh, a staff in the building, whether it's the principal or the vice principal. Yeah, thank that, you. That's I a didn't... very important clarification. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. So, so look, I'll take this next session, a section. Um, so let, let mm. I'm going to ground us in this next section um, in EJA's work, right? Um, we've been doing this, you know, like uh, Yvonne said earlier, for a number of years. And again, appreciation you all for even inviting us to this space and allowing us the opportunity to share our perspective and our work. Um, and we're excited because, um, you know, if you look across the country this summer, so many different districts around the country have taken the bold step to remove or in their contracts with school resource officers. And, and this work has been happening, you know, with allies and partners of ours across the country for many years, right? This isn't new work. This isn't something that, you know, necessarily just happened all of a sudden because of all of what came about um, this summer, right? There has been work that has been done historically for years in communities across the country, just like the work that EJA has been doing for at least the last four years, calling for a different way of being in our schools. And so on September 1st, we launched in a partnership with uh, the Wake County Black Student Coalition, which is a group of brilliant young people, black and brown young people who are students in Wake County Public Schools who have had their own experiences and, and the experiences of their friends and, and fellow classmates with school resource officers that weren't positive experiences. They created and formed themselves together as an organization so that they could call for the removal of school resource officers. So we are partnering with them as well as um, the Southern Coalition for Social Justice and the Youth Justice Project, which is an arm of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, and then the ACLU of North Carolina. So we um, publicly launched our proposal, Building Peace in Wake County Public Schools. And it's a proposal to replace school resource officers with peace builders. Lynn, you can go to the next slide for me. So um, just some more history. We think history is important, right? Context is always important when we're having conversations like this. Um, in 2014, students and advocates and other organizations filed a complaint um, 
with the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice against Wake County Public Schools and multiple local law enforcement agencies. And, and the basis of that complaint, right, was really noting the disproportionate um, contact between school resource officers and black students in Wake County Public Schools, and in particular with a focus uh, on black boys at that time. Then in 2018, uh, Wake County Public Schools entered, entered into a voluntary agreement with the Office of Civil Rights as a result of that civil rights complaint that we all filed, um, agreeing to revise some of their discipline policies and expand their restorative uh, justice practices and reduce unnecessary referrals to law enforcement. Next slide, please. So when we look at um, you know, the data, because data is important, we, we believe data tells a story. And then we also always like to try to couple data with actual lived experience of young people and parents in our schools. So this, this data we have from 2018, the 2018-2019 school year shows that 73% of complaints to the adult or juvenile justice system from Wake County Public Schools were against Black students. Um, who only made up 22% of Boyd County public school system enrollment. Um, and then this data, this next slide breaks it down even more. So there's that first data point that I just mentioned. If you look, white students make up 45.9% of the district um, in total enrollment, but only 16% of the referrals. And then Latinx students make up 18% and they received about 9% of the delinquency complaints. So for, for us, right, at the root of, of the harmful impact of having school resource officers in, in our schools is the disproportionate impact, right, the disparity that exists for Black students in particular. So for us, SROs are something that's costly, it's, you know, an ineffective um, tool, and it's harmful to students and to our school climate. Uh, when students perceive a negative school climate, they're they are likely um, to be, are less likely to be engaged and more likely to be uh, truant or drop out. And we actually use a different uh, language. We believe that um, instead of young people dropping out, oftentimes the case is that young people will be pushed out. When you're in an environment that doesn't inherently see the value of you, or you are, are felt, um, are treated like you're a criminal, why would you wanna be there, right? So that phenomenon for us is actually push out. Um, schools safety exists when we build school climates that are positive for young people. So, um, you know, I have two children currently that are in Wake County. I have a senior, my daughter's a senior, my son's um, in ninth grade. And I never forget when my now 21 year old went to high school, and she would come home and tell me about, oh, I saw the school resource officer body slam somebody in the lunchroom today or zip tie somebody in the lunchroom today. And this is her classmates. These are her schoolmates. And so to and the question for her was, why did they have to use that kind of force for a, a teenager? Like I, it, it was mind boggling for her. Right. And even for my uh, current students. Right. My son you know, definitely has had a different experience as a young person in Wake County Public Schools starting in middle school than my daughters. There was a lot more um, targeting or uh, looking at, you know, normal child behavior as a negative thing, um, which was, you know, because of the work I do wasn't surprising, but it was, it was because he's went to all the schools my daughters have went to, right? And, and the experience is different. Um, we also go back one, to that first page real quick. Yeah. So again, back to the school climates, right? That we believe we're not asking for some, you know, anarchy in schools or, or creating a space that there aren't um, places where young people, if they make mistakes, right? That there isn't a way to address that. We're actually saying school, resource officers, law enforcement in school is not gonna get us there, right? We're, we're talking about creating a space that allows for young people to be their best self and fully actualize, which is what the promise of public education is supposed to be for us. Um, and we also recognize that one of the most effective methods to improve school climate is to engage with students and educators in a pro-social activities that build positive relationships and instill a sense of community throughout the, the campus. Next slide, Lynn.
um, we are calling for um, an environment that creates safety in school. And we recognize again that the way that we get to safer schools is to build a positive school climate. So restorative justice initiatives are effective at making schools safer by improving the school climate and promoting emotional, social, and communication skills that follow young people from their youth to adulthood. So these are, you know, real life skills that they can use when they leave school and enter, you know, college and then later the workforce. Uh, we also recognize that school-based mental health services have proven uh, to improve school climate and to reduce disciplinary incidents. So when young people, again, feel safe and supported and when they're in, um, have moments of mental health issues, whether it's, you know, before it even gets to the crisis point, right? What would it look like to create an environment in school that actually meets young people where they are and the young people who need some additional supports, we have the resources right there in school to provide that support to them. Um, we also recognize these preventative measures currently don't receive the necessary funding for the adequate and effective implementation. We noted not too long ago um, that, you know, Wake County's ratio, somebody in the chat mentioned the ratio for school psychologists um, is better than what, you know, we originally thought and also named some of the things that school psychologists could potentially do to help our young people. So what would it look like if we prioritize psychologists and nurses and mental health professionals, if we took resources and invested more heavily, you know, in that. I can say, you know, um, our current board for Wake County Public Schools, I, they have been, you know, doing the work over the last few years to try to increase resources to support that, but it requires a, a whole nother shift um, as well to ensure that we have additional resources to support um, those preventative measures. Next slide, please. Um, and then our, our proposal centers around um, a viable, what we believe to be a, a viable alternative to school resource officers, and it's called Peace Builders. And so we're really asking for our community, our community at large, but our school community in particular, right, to really think about what it would mean to invest in community peace builders and divest from school policing. So the goal of our Peace Builder program is to create safe, nurturing environments in Wake County public school system um, without investing in or facilitating the further criminalization and push out of students of color. You know, our Peace Builder program would focus on prevention and positive intervention rather than on punitive approaches that desperately criminalize and often traumatize students of color. And then Wake County, we're really asking Wake County Public Schools uh, to fully divest all funds from school policing and invest in this Peace Builder model. Um, which again would intentionally build positive relationships with students as well as with their parents and provide intervention support to teachers and administrators. So, you know, it's a next slide, please, Lynn. It's really a model that thinks about how do you place uh, like a community intervention worker within the school um, that, and this, this next slide really just shows the difference between what a peace builder and a law enforcement officer would be, right? Um, so the way a peace builder would view our prospective students and families is as an interventionist. So from the idea of intervention that identifies the strengths and potentials of young people and their families, right? Well, we recognize that law enforcement officers oftentimes are coming from a criminal, um, looking for criminals, that's their job, that's the training that they receive. So they are trained to see pe people as victims and are perpetrators and seek outcomes that enforce the law, not to consider the best interests of the student. So profiling is a key aspect of their ongoing training. And then listening with compassion and empathy, listening practices are necessary skills for peace builders, right? So someone who's heavily vested in really hearing young people and sometimes listening when it comes to young people, if you're a parent, right? And I already told you, I'm a parent currently of two teenagers. So listening also uh, oftentimes will require understanding what they're not saying uh, sometimes and really having empathy uh, empathy for young people and helping them because it, at that age, right, it, we're talking about middle to high school, that, that's a really difficult age sometimes for even um, the expression of how they're feeling or what's going on. And so we really need to have 
folks in our school building that are trained to understand that, to really understand um, the social and emotional um, place where young people are, right? And, and that can really um, help them navigate some of the, the skills that have not yet been developed in them, right? So, you know, when we think about listening, we're also thinking about controlling rumors and preventing retaliation. Um, hearing and addressing youth and family concerns, mediating conflicts and building trust, right? Building trust with young people is a powerful mechanism to be used, right? To help young people if they're having issues. If you a young person trusts you, right, and something's going on, they're more likely to come to you for support and for help and resolution if there is a problem. Um, police officers follow like a military style hierarchy. Um, they're listening to their superior officers and following the orders uh, that are essential skills for a police officer or a deputy, not listening compassionately to better understand students' needs. So they have a certain kind of training, right? They need this training because they are, um, their position is one uh, to root out crime or quote unquote criminals. Uh, in terms of tools for the job, peace builders only need, you know, a cell phone with access to email and text messages and or a laptop to keep track of data and connect students and families to resources, right? So those are the tools of their job. Whereas officers carry loaded guns, chemical spray, tasers, a baton, bulletproof vest, a radio and handcuffs, all in plain sight of students and parents. So you know, to come into your school building and see uh, a law enforcement officer with a gun, that isn't necessarily for all students a comforting experience. That isn't an experience that makes them feel safer or that they'll be kept out of harm's way. Uh, in terms of uniforms, right, peace builders wear casual clothing to make them more approachable um, for students and parents and even teachers and other administrators, right? There isn't uniform, especially law enforcement uniforms, there's a certain level of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not coming to my mind right now, but there's a certain, yes, it is. It's a certain level of standoffness, right? Mm -hmm. That can be attached to a uniform that doesn't allow people to let their guard down or even be in better relationships um, with each other. And then in terms of the success, peace builders success uh, would be measured by the number of positive relationships they have established, the conflicts they have solved, lives that they have saved, saved and students that they have kept safe. Um, the success of an SRO program is often measured by how many arrests have been made or how many citations have been given out. Um, and so, uh, next slide. So we, you know, we wanted in this proposal to be able to clearly lay out um, for anyone seeing it for the first time or even wrestling with this idea for the first time. And we recognize, right, that we have all been conditioned to believe that safety equates to a certain thing. And we're we're out actually asking you all, right, this audience that's listening um, to this presentation who may, you know, interact with the video later, right, to entertain another idea, right? We're not saying, Ooh, we just want to throw our hands up and, you know, make our schools these lawless places. No, we're actually saying we want to create a culture and a climate in our schools that are conducive to the growth of all young people. It's not fair, right, that the disproportionate disproportionality exists and so that Black students are more negatively impacted. And it is not because Black children do more harm. I have numerous, numerous uh, stories and conversations, right, where I know for a fact white students have been given a pass, who, who have done things and have been let go, right, and not given the same consequences that their Black counterparts have, right? And so, you know, we're asking again, in Wake County Public Schools, to take steps to abolish school policing, you know, remove all school resource officers in all contracts between Wake County Public School System and the law enforcement agencies that serve as school resource officers. We're asking that the funding that they currently um, receive uh, that have paid for police in our schools, that funding be diverted um, for the additional 
funding into hiring and training paid peace builders. And, you know, I just publicly want to go on record to say at this point, we have not gotten any school board member to commit to this idea. We're in conversations, right? We're talking to them. The young people from the Wake County Black Student Coalition is, you know, making the case. But at this point, nobody has said <laughs> unequivocally that they agree with our position. But that isn't going to stop us from uh, making this call and still pushing this proposal. So the steps that, you know, we are also asking us to take, right, to abolish um, policing in Wake County public schools. Uh, we would like to, if we had a pilot program for peace builders in uh, some of our schools as a start, we would love to enlist the support of local colleges and universities in, assess in assessing the program's impact on school climate, on discipline disparities, on school-based arrests, and community engagement, right? And so we, what we're really saying is we want a um, separate entity, right, to assess that pilot program if it's in Wake County. We don't want Wake County to do it. We don't want to do it. We want a separate entity um, who has the skills and resources to do that for us. We also want, you know, that process to allow parents and students and community members um, once some findings come out to, you know, if there's something that needs to be tweaked, to let's look, make adjustments. That, let's look at the Peace Builder um, program based on that assessment and, and make adjustments and if adjustments are necessary. Uh, Fernando, before we jump into, we have a lot of questions here that Lynn's going to start uh, rotating out of the question box. Did you want to add anything uh, to uh, Letha's comments? Yes, uh, basically what um, what we want to make sure people understand is that what we are proposing is the creation of a new job description within Wake County Public Schools, a peace builder, or what we call, or basically a peace builder will be an interventionist counselor, if that makes any sense. Somebody who is placed in the schools and the only job is to intervene, right? To work on prevention and intervention rather than in punishment. So we're talking in here about preventing and making sure that they intervene and making sure that they are working with the whole school community. And by this we mean uh, cafeteria workers, uh, bus drivers, um, you know, all the type of maintenance staff, uh, classroom teachers, the school administrator. We are hoping that this person will build a relationship with the whole school community and work with the school to turn that school into a, what we call relationship centered school. Relationship centered school is basically thinking at every aspect of the school uh, community or, or the journey of the school uh, in a way that is going to help us to build relationship with that student, right? In a way that is going to help us to build relationship with that family, right? Of that student, with the parents, making sure that in any decision making process we have, we consider all these aspects of that student and that family, not so much of, uh, you know, whether or not they need to refer them to criminal journal court, but making sure that they know where they're coming from. Relationship centered schools is a, a way to transform the school environment to a more positive and welcoming and safer school environment where the teachers can teach and the students can learn. Okay, so we have a lot of questions here, so we're gonna move to that. Lynn, you wanna start us off? I do, I have several. Um, has there has the Peace Builder program been done anywhere else? Can you tell us a little bit about that? You want me to go? You want to go? I'll you kick us off and in. Yeah. You so we we originally got the idea uh, from some colleagues of ours in Los Angeles. There's a um, an alternative school um, based in Los Angeles called the Chuco Center. And this is where we first saw the model being in place, right? Where they hired folks from the community. They didn't have law enforcement or school resource officer. They had the, the whole slide that showed the difference. We actually got that from them. So there is a, a place that has 
you know, peace builders um, in its entirety. And then also the components of peace builders, right? We're talking about somebody who's trained in um, de-escalation tactics, in, um, in uh, conflict resolution, in restorative or transformative justice. Um, the components of what would make up a peace builder, there's plenty of research and data to support the ways those individual components actually shift and change the culture and climate in schools. Yes, we actually are very familiar with restorative justice um, at Great Schools in Wake and Public Schools First and See. I know we've got some resources on our website that people can look at, but um, it, you're right. The restorative justice practices ha are very effective across the country and there is data to support that. With your pilot program that you're considering, or you hope to get WCPSS to consider, would you do? Do you want to do that in middle school or high school, or well, I imagine you want to do it both. But do you yes. you intend to start it at one or the other? Well, well, let me be uh, honest with all of you because I'm an honest person. The proposal called for two components: one, the removal of police officers from the school building. We want to make sure that we start with removing police officers from the school building. And two, that we implement uh, peace builder programs in the schools. When we first started this campaign, we asked the county public schools to at least look at 10 middle schools uh, and pilot the program in these 10 middle schools. Uh, but right now, we are asking the school district to even engage in the conversation with us about how we can go about implementing a peace builder pilot program. Uh, and we do know that um, the question comes to money, always is about money. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if the next question is about money. Um, so Wake County Public School has more or less 163,000 students, right? Almost 200 schools, $1.8 billion a year by it. We're talking about $1.8 billion a year. Another, in another time, we asked the school district to even consider the allocation of one tenth of one percent of their annual budget. We're not even talking about one percent of the annual budget. We're talking about one tenth of one percent, which it will give us at least eight hundred thousand dollars to implement peace building programs uh, in summer schools. Right? I, don't, I wasn't sure we were going to be able to do it in tennis schools, but summer schools. They never could find the money because there is never money. The next thing I know, unilaterally, they go ahead and hire a Florida company as a consultant to do an assessment on school safety and security, and they went ahead and spent $800,000 on it. So two things, we're asking for the removal of police officers, and we're asking to actually uphold your principles and values. If you do, the, the budget is a moral document. If you actually valued uh, every child every day, that includes black children too, and those that are 70% referred to criminal court. If you actually want to uh, live your values, and I say that the language because that's the language that board members have been using, every child every day, then we're asking you to prioritize in the budget the allocation of resources for peace building program. No, we actually use that argument too, that budgets are moral documents and you want to see where your values lie, you look at the but your budget, whether that's the state level or the county level or the school system's budget. I wouldn't want to try to pick apart how that $800,000 money got used versus what you were asking for. Um, I think it would be more fair to have a school board member respond to that than we, we would. Um, but Letha, let me ask you, are you, do you try to reach more parents? Because I think regardless of what we think and regardless of what school board members think, you won't achieve this goal without a lot of public support. So yeah. are you able to talk to parents that maybe don't share your perspective? For example, are you able to go to PTAs outside of Raleigh, Raleigh's schools or magnet schools, are you able to talk to parents broadly across the county? Um, have you ever been invited or tried to go to a PTA meeting or things of that nature? How are you trying to reach the public? 
Yeah. So, you know, again, we just launched this forward a public proposal September 1st. Previously, our work, the way, you know, EJA works, right? We work directly. We're a grassroots community-based organization, right? And we work directly with Black and Brown parents in particular, right? Parents who are most directly impacted by these issues that we're actually naming. And so there's also work that you know, has to be done within those communities as well. So we've hold, held, you know, internal meetings, public forums. This venue right here is an opportunity for us to reach some of those families, right? Which is why we agree. We've been, you know, in the last two to three months, um, had numerous webinars that we've been a part of that we've hosted and other folks have hosted to get the word out. And we're always open, right? So if there's a PTA out there, um, that is interested in hosting us and learning more and they come across this, right? Our contact information will be available and we are always open to having the conversation, right? Because we do recognize that that part of this work um, is not only just the internal work that we're doing as an organization and that our coalition partners are doing, all of that structure is all about reaching a larger audience. So we are most certainly open uh, to engaging with anyone in this conversation. Because, and again, you know, uh, Fernando named uh, budgets as a moral document. This work for me is moral work, right? This work is rooted in my value, right? And the, the recognition that my black children and black children like them and brown children like them that attend Wake County Public Schools have value and that our district should uphold the value of all students and that we create a space, right? That in inherently recognizes that you're valuable regardless of the color of your skin or your education background as a family or your economic status, right? And so we exist as an organization um, to ensure that that value is rooted and centered um, in the district and in the interactions that the district has with our students and our families. So one of the things that people are asking is how is this concept of a peace builder um, different from like a school counselor who is involved in mediations and restorative justice and all those kind of things? Can this be the same person or can this be can school counselors be trained in this this process? No, because the challenge with that is that school counselors also wear other hats, right? So where do we have school counselors that are dedicated to only this? Do, do we have that that exists? My interactions with guidance counselors, you know, for my children in from middle school through high school, right, is oftentimes they wear the hats of test administrators, right? Um, even the peer mediation or mediation that happens, right, in some of our uh, middle schools, it's a peer mediation um, process where our students are trained to be peer mediators. What we're saying is let's invest resources in individuals who their entire job would be is this, right? So if if we invest the, um, the dollars or the money to actually create the position for peace builders, of course, it makes sense for um, guidance counselors to have some of this training, but they won't be able to hold the work, right? And we want individuals who is fully invested in the peace builder um, pilot or program and, and in the work of a peace builder to be able to fully hold that that title and that work so that um, you know something else can't steer us off course in the day-to-day -day operation of a school. So I'll just do a quick follow-up. Um, so one of the things that parents are asking in our questions and always comes to mind so if you don't have SRO officers, what do you do about problems when students have drugs on campus or weapons are on campus? Um, how are those situations dealt with uh, within your model? This, this is a very valid question though. And um, we have to also remember that marketing has been very effective, right? And when they, when the National School Resource Officer um, organizations that are proposing uh, SROs, they offer them as teachers and as uh, counselors and all these things. But one of the things that they also said is that they will be the one stopping uh, uh, an active shooter, for example. But a lot of the parents who are asking these questions right now uh, probably went to school without having an SRO in the school, right? So how did they deal with how did they deal with that kind of incident in the past, 
right? I will encourage us to consider and think and, and remember how it happened. Uh, I'm pretty sure that when that happened, they called the police and the police came from outside to deal with that situation, right? So we 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 know that police could be called, you know, in these kind of situations. Uh, we're not saying don't call the police, but what we're saying is end to the regular presence of police officers in the school building, right? Uh, and now that I'm talking about uh, active shooters, I also want to make sure that I anticipate this question because there is no research that shows that having an armed police officer in the school building is effective at stopping uh, active shooter incidents. Uh, as a matter of fact, in one of the recent incidents in Parkland, in Florida, the SRO who was placed in the school walked away from that active shooter. The other thing that we find out since that happened, I look into a secret server report that they actually address the school shooting issues. Uh, and they, in their report, they say, there is no evidence that having regular presence of armed police officers in the schools reduce the time in which a law enforcement will respond to an active shooter. They say in that report that more or less the time in which the police will respond to an active shooter is three minutes, regardless of that school having a police officer in the building, or if you call the police officer from outside. There is no evidence. And I was intrigued by this, so I talked to a law enforcement. And what this person told me is that by training, we are not allowed to approach an active shooter until we call for backup and we have the backup. So there is no, that, that is not gonna stop an active shooter either having police officer, police in, in the building at the same time. Uh, plus, uh, we know that those are all the topics that need to be addressed about gun control and, and background check and other situations. But I want to make the point that uh, that's, those are very valid questions and, and, and um, that's what happened. And, and I would just also offer, right? So in all of, um, you know, in, in many of the most recent, um, unfortunate school shooting incidences that have happened in our country. And it's not a, you know, statistically, it's not a huge number, although the impact, you know, is horrible, right? And and nobody's excusing um, that. But what we also um, have to recognize that a lot of the reports you hear afterwards is about the young people and how troubled they were or that they've had mental health issues. So what would it have looked like had the school had something in place like a peace builder right that was able to build a relationship right that had mental health training that was able to recognize early on some signs right that's preventative that that's what we're talking about and you know we're inviting us all to re-examine um this notion of um safety of what would it mean to shift our school climate and environment that created space for you know adults in the building to recognize when young people are on the cusp of a crisis or if they're in a crisis right and to prevent something like a terrible school shooting uh to happen so one thing i, I want to ask and i'm gonna give Lana a chance to go through some of her questions the the funding let's go back to the funding for a second um a couple of things have come up on the funding. One, um, someone saying, is some of this funding, since we know now that a lot of the money for SROs comes from locals, right? Uh, the, the SRO amount of money, I think the school board members told us the last time that comes out of the school budget is about 15,000, some 200 or something. And that a lot of the money comes from individual municipalities. So is this something, the question is, is that we need to be reaching out more and talking also to municipalities, to the city town councils and city councils, um, since some of that funding may be of their funding that we want to redirect or we might want them to add. Um, you know, what kind of role do you see local municipalities who all have uh, many schools within their district um, how could they be involved in this or should they be involved in this? Um, I, I appreciate that question. And I want to also make sure that we understand that 
the cost to the taxpayers of having police officers in the school building is not $15,000 as the board has shown it to us because there is money coming from local, there is money coming from the state grant, and also all the, how many were, 37 deputies from the sheriff. Uh, only in salaries, those deputies cost taxpayers like you and I almost $3 million a year. Uh, because it's about $50,000 in an average, right? Only on salaries. We're not talking about equipment. We're not talking about pension. We're not talking about all these benefits. Uh, so I want to make sure that we also know that the cost to taxpayers, right, for having police in the schools is way larger than those $15,000 that the board members are showing us. Um, and the school district is talking about that. And then to your question, yes, this is something where we want to make sure that Every, we are in conversation with everybody. Municipalities, the same way they have taken leadership to militarize the schools, because some municipalities are putting police officers in elementary schools voluntarily. They are paying those uh, SROs in elementary schools, Apex and Holly Springs. The same way they're taking initiative to put police in the schools, it, which, by the way, those police in the schools, we were told uh, by uh, a leader in Apex that that doesn't cost them $37,000 a year. It costs them almost $200,000 when they actually include all the equipment, benefit, and all the stuff that they actually include. That's what we were told. So the cost of taxpayers is way larger than what they are presenting it to us. So in the same way they are uh, uh, open to put police in the schools, we want them to actually work with the school uh, leadership, with the superintendent, right, with, with, with the administration and central office, with some school principals, uh, and actually step up and actually provide the funding for peace builders, right? But at the same time, we, need, we want to make sure that this is funded by multiple layers, municipalities, county commissioners. We're going to be talking to some county commissioners uh, in the near future. Uh, and also the governor, right? If we talk, if we're having a prime prevention uh, unit or something like that, we need to be talking about alternatives. Um, I, I refuse to believe that the only thing that we think about when we think about safety is having police officers. We need to be able to think out of the box, right? Lita, uh, I like what she called it. She said, let's use radical imagination, right? Why do we believe that the school safety is only going to be addressed by an armed police officer with military training. We must use some radical imagination and look for the things that are actually going to work for our community. Yes, we can look at the Los Angeles model and Oakland and Boston, all the places where they have other type of models. But at the end of the day, Yvonne, Lynn, and all the people that listen to us, at the end of the day, it, we are the one can create our own models. Way County, we have the capacity to become national model if we come out with this field program and it's effective. We could be leading at the national level if we want to. So let me just wrap this back because a couple of the people who are in the comments are saying, please, please get this out, reach out and share this information with town and city council members. But they're kind of left out of the loop often with, uh, you, you know, when we talk to county commissioners who are tuned into schools because they fund them, uh, the operating uh, budget, um, who, um, and to uh, the legislators, uh, they're saying, don't forget that you've got really important partners, especially since you mentioned Apex and Holly Springs. Um, some of the members of, uh, of those town councils have said, this is information they'd like to see coming back to their town council. And the second piece of that is someone says, you know, the governor just uh, uh, used some uh, funds to hire additional social workers, nurses, school counselors, and so forth. Um, now they're saying that in kind of two ways here. One is, hey, we are making a little progress on some of these other mental health professionals we desperately need. And then the side uh, bar comment they're making about this, and I'm just sharing this with you, this is not really a question is that perhaps as we start growing that budget, um, that there's a way to try to uh, ask for some of those funds to be um, used in, in, in a model peace building program. So if we're gonna hire uh, 12 new social workers, could we have three of those social workers 
positions be allocated to peace building uh, things. So this is just a comment they're making. This is not really a question. Um, but Lynn, I didn't want to overlook um, some important questions in the chat. Do you see anything else that we've overlooked? And I would say appreciation for those comments, right? Um, because that thinking, whoever posted those comments is the same you know, thought process uh, we have. We definitely um, have a strategy in place for us to um, build out and share this information. And, you know, it has to start closer to home in terms of with school board members and, and school personnel, and we'll build out um, that uh, our request for meetings and our ability to talk um, to decision makers at every level, um, because we recognize, right, consensus building is a powerful tool. And the more people you can share this information with, especially people who have the power to influence um, how money is spent and allocated. Um, yeah, so definitely appreciation for those comments. And they can also help us, Lita, if they go to our website, they mm -hmm. can download proposal and they can actually share that with the city council members. Good plug, Fernando. Thank all you. The hell we can. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think that um, the the thing that um, so so follow up on that is that a lot of people are saying, you know, we we have you know social workers, um, school counselors with school social workers school counselors i put the word school first okay because social workers are now as specialized as doctors are uh, but school social workers school psychologists school counselors school nurses um, some of our comments are saying these are wonderful people who are trained already to work in this work um, and they could do this work and they're licensed and trained to do it there just aren't enough positions for them so they're 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 saying that um, it, you know encouraging you to 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 link these professionals to your concept of what what kind of training would a peace builder have versus the kind of training that a police officer has. They're saying suggesting that you try to link these because people understand what a school counselor does and a school psychologist does and a school social worker does. Um, you're just uh, but it'd be someone as you said who is full time for this not trying to get you transcripts, writing you letters to get into college or to get a job or um, not trying to um, deal with uh, family, uh, connecting your family with services, but dealing with students in, in place. I, yeah, I and, and I just person. wanna say that we definitely get that, right? The name of our pro proposal, you know, and we didn't say this, I don't know why at the beginning, but Counselors Not Cops is our campaign, right? Oh. So we recognize, you know, the value of counselors, but but we also have to, you know, name that um, the counselors need to be culturally responsive, right? That they need to be uh, trained in um, equity training, anti-racism training, like, because what, if you don't explicitly name these things, some of these same disparities that exist systemically within the district, when it, we look at the disproportionate impact on black and brown students, with interactions with school resource officers, with suspensions, that, that same thing could be there if we don't dismantle and be really um, intentional about building up the cultural competency of anybody who's interacting in the school space with um, young people. So I wanted to name that. Lynn, do you have another question from our audience? Just a couple things. So we're down to about 10 minutes left with our time together. I wanna to respect everybody's time. Um, we've had some great questions uh, proposed, and I wanted to shout out, we have a um, Wake County counselor on tonight, and she has uh, just reminded us, and this piggybacks on something that Lisa said, that when we think of a bigger definition of school safety and how to keep students safe, that is so much further beyond the role of an SRO officer or someone that is reacting to incidents in a school, whether it's a fight or a crisis, you know, that if we can think of it in, in the whole child perspective of social, emotional well-being, crisis intervention, pre prevention of issues between students, et cetera, much of what you've described as a peace builder, what they would do. And Letha, I love the point you made about our current school counselors that often 
there is no way they can dedicate their time to this work. And that is a great distinction to make um, about why, because I think a lot of people misunderstand that school counselors spend their days counseling students on mental health issues and behavioral issues and that's just not all of what they do so i think that was a great point that you made um, i don't see any reason why we can't share the peace builder proposal on our social media uh, we can certainly send people to your website but we can also share it directly on ours and since that was the topic of tonight's conversation i think we're going to definitely share that document online. So I think it's already online, Lynn. And in fact, I know that um, we put it out this when it came out on, as a social media post. Right. But, uh, I hope tonight when y'all are watching this program and when it's watched again, recorded, that we'll do that. And, uh, and we need to put it out again, like Lynn said. Yeah. yeah, feel free to share it as a PDF and a link to our website. I think that's really appreciated. You can do both. Uh, one of the things that someone is, um, I, I, because what Lynn just reminded me of the time, I'm wondering if I could just read a couple of comments here quickly to share with y'all. So it'll be on a recorded, uh, wow. recorded here, uh, because I think they're, uh, the comments and the questions are very positive and I, I i think you should know that um while they have a lot of questions like where is the funding going to come and what are you going to do when the drugs are in the schools these are legitimate questions but i think you, what we see is that there's a, a strong positive um thing here one person suggested that you ask superintendent Moore to appoint an ombudsman to work with developing a pilot program where, you know maybe maybe you don't have uh, 14 positions right now but they're saying how about trying to see if you could get a couple assistant principals who usually have to deal with discipline to see if there'd be some folks who'd be willing to pilot this um, and to oversee it. I thought that was a positive question. Someone said um, in here, um, why, where can we find the memorandum agreement, Lynn, for the um, SROs for this year? Some I folks. I posted the link to that twice in the answers column, but we can definitely share that on social media after tonight. Okay. And, but I linked and, it. I linked it in the in the question box as well. Okay. So one of the things that we'll do, um, based on what Lynn has said, is that when we send you all, um, thank you for attending. Uh, we'll put links in that uh, for uh, EJ A and for uh, the proposal and for the SRO memorandum because a lot of parents are saying they can't find it on the website um, at uh, Wake County Public Schools. Um, here says uh, we have a number of students that have drugs. Um, appreciate that you're saying that you know call the police that these are things that um, can be done. Um, someone said yes they remember you know they didn't have cops in schools when they came along i am sorry we didn't say counselors not cops because i think that makes people understand um peace building um a little bit a uh, little better um and then one person said you know how uh how are we going to convince white parents that schools will be safe without police officers um uh, uh, so that's a pretty straightforward question, but you know, we're all in the transparency. Yeah, I doubt room. that is not the first time you've heard that question. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, I would definitely encourage my white parents, right, to um, do that convincing, because I, I, you know, I, I struggle as a black woman, right? I don't necessarily feel like that is my um, role to convince white people. But my role is to provide the information and the experiences and, and the disproportionality. And you all like um, you all open in this space for us is, is one way. And I also, again, um, thank you for that. But I also encourage it, the folks listening now and who will listen later to get in touch with us. We are always open to conversation. But it's it really at the core of this for white parents, for black parents, for any parent who this is a new idea to examine, right, based off of this information we're sharing with you, your notions of safety and what they're rooted in and, and to 
think about the other side, right? The, the young people and their families who are disparately impacted by disproportionality that exists in the ways in which police operate currently, our law enforcement in general operate in our schools and, and the data bears this out, right? And so it, it really is about um, getting uncomfortable or comfortable with a new reality, right? That maybe you haven't entertained, that your young people don't have to um, even reckon with, right? Because they don't face racism or discrimination because of the color of their skin or the accent that they have or whatever, right? And so, you know, we're we're open in this space and creating um, the space for us to be, um, oh, Fernando quoted me earlier, right? And I didn't forget my quote, Fernando. Lord, I've been Radical saying it for so long. Radical imagination, right? Radical imagination is a beautiful thing, especially when we think about creating the world that we all deserve. So I, I put this slide up here because I think everyone, everybody to see Education Justice Alliance at Gmail, it's very easy to remember. We didn't, if we didn't get to your question or we didn't get a full enough answer to your question or you just have advice or suggestions um, for uh, Letha and Fernando, please, uh, follow, you know, you've got their email now. You can talk with them directly after this uh, event's over tonight. And they have a Facebook page Education Justice Alliance, Raleigh NC, you can find it really easy where they're posting a lot of articles and updates and facts and figures and so forth. I would like to just add um, a personal note as someone who uh, also has had three children um, go through the Wake County Public School System uh, during a time when there were not SROs in our schools for the most part, uh, at least two of them. I'm trying not to age myself too much here, Lynn. Uh, but one, uh, uh, the older two, um, certainly there were fights at school. There were drugs at school. Um, there were uh, uh, petty larceny at school. There were things that were going on in school that were crime related. Uh, and yes, when those things happened, the principal made the decision and they called the police and the police were there very quickly uh, because uh, and every school back back then, a lot of the schools had a relationship with, they basically, like Athens Drive High School, had a police officer that basically, that was on duty. The principal usually knew who was on duty in the neighborhood. You know, uh, sometimes the police officers would come on campus, sometimes they'd cruise by. There were police officers, there was a presence in our community, but they were not inside our building. Um, and yes, they were called when they needed to be. Uh, so I, I do think that um, we're not talking about not having law enforcement help with crime and things that need more than um, this. I, I would also just say that um, the, the thing about um, that you're asking about for the peace building model is so also deeply connected and, and, and marches in line with something that we've been working on for the last five years. We know that a lot of children in our school system right now need access to mental health services. This is a this is a concept that you know, irregardless of SROs or peace builders, right? But it goes hand in glove with some of the things you're you're pushing for. We know that a lot of kids are coming to school with the need for a school psychologist, and we know that 85% of the kids who are income eligible who need these services, if they do not get them in school, they do not get them at all. Right. So if we have troubled youth, they become troubled adults. Uh, some even if they make it through uh, graduation, uh, they are they, we haven't addressed these issues. So I'm really um, I found this whole thing very compelling um, to look at how this um, can kind of wed itself with the need for more mental health professionals and how we allocate their time into not only mitigating issues, but preventing them. I love that you said that earlier, Letha. It's very much like adverse childhood experiences that Lynn and I have talked to hundreds of people about. You know, one, we always want to prevent first because we'd like them not to happen, but we also know that you have to intervene and mitigate when, when things are going wrong. So this has been a very powerful conversation. Um, Lynn, I want to make sure that I didn't uh, give you one last chance. If you saw any other comment or question you wanted to add before, I'm going to let Lita and Fernando 
say some closing words. I, we are all set. I want to hear what these um, wonderful people have to say. And thank you both again. We really appreciate your time. And I want to give you uh, the last few minutes to see if you have any closing comments or questions you'd like to, or things you'd like to share with the audience before we sign off. Sure, I appreciate uh, the invitation though. And um, at a later time, I, uh, well, I'd love to continue the conversation in the future. That's uh, that's what I, um, I'd like to say. Um, but, I also want to make sure that people understand that what we're proposing here is a uh, interventionist counselor, basically somebody who will be placed in the schools to intervene, right? Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't get tired of repeating that we want the peace builder or peacemaker to work on prevention inter and intervention and build relationship with the whole school community rather than punishment. Um, and if, if the school needs to deal with some drug-related or gun-related issues, we call them from outside. Uh, but the peace builder is a person who, because it's not a law enforcement, it's not a, uh, doesn't have a training, uh, we definitely uh, have high expectation that this person is going to help to transform the school environment. But more important, it's going to help to reduce the referrals to criminal and juvenile court of uh, Black students. and. I didn't say earlier, but the other thing that we're looking into is the impact of undocumented students because we have law enforcement in the school building in the first place. So, um, you know, that's, that's the other benefit because uh, we do know that with the current administration we have, uh, at any given moment, any interaction with law enforcement could actually put a, a, an immigrant family in deportation processes. So, having put, removed police uh, from the school is also going to help to keep immigrant families safer as well. And I would just end again with a deep appreciation for you all cultivating this space and inviting us into it to share our proposal, to share our work and our, our insights and goals um, for Wake County Public Schools and for, for students across the district, right? Um, and I invite the listening audience again to reach out to us if there are additional questions that you have, if you need some more clarification, if you want to join us in this um, call to remove school resource officers. The invitation is open for any of that, and, and we're open to presenting in other spaces uh, as well. And again, I'm calling us to this moment, right, that we're currently in, um, where we can radically reimagine the world that we are a part of and the schools that we help um, to fund and create so that all of our young people are seen as valuable, right, and can show up in whatever way they are currently able to show up and still walk fully in their human value. So thank you again. You're welcome. And of course, on behalf of uh, Public Schools First and uh, Great Schools in Wake, I have to do this ending drill, which is, you know, you know that you know the drill, right? Connect with us. But I really do want to encourage you um, to not take this lightly. I mean, Lynn's going to be posting a lot of stuff on Great Schools in Wake over the next couple of days to, uh, related to this uh, webinar. Uh, we've been invited to ch uh, check out the Facebook page for the Educational Justice Alliance. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of information in our newsletter, uh, our website, Public Schools First. As Lynn mentioned earlier, we have a lot of issues driven things on there about equity, about racism, about school funding, about the need for mental health counselors. We talk a lot about adverse childhood experiences and the things that we need to do to intervene. And we talk a lot about the things that impact students to bring them into school situation that's not advantageous. The lack of health care, um, the, the lack of uh, Medicaid expansion, the issues of poverty and homelessness and hunger in our community. So we really know that all of these things impact children and that, that's why we care about those things before those kids come to school. So we invite you to check us out, to get be a part of the information stream. Um, I, I wanna uh, close by saying that um, I love this proposal. I appreciate the work you've put into it and the, the personal time you both put into it. It shows with your passion and your, your concern about uh, children. 
and we uh, we concur that there has to be a better way there has to be something more we can do to support kids and keep them in school and stop the school to prison pipeline so thank you for your advocacy work and i hope that people will invite you to come speak to them we've had a couple people here in the chat line want to know if you're speaking again and uh, you know, let's see how it goes. And absolutely, uh, we're gonna check back with you guys uh, in the future and see if you'll come back and do some reporting in to let us know some of the progress we've made, okay? So Definitely, thank you all. Me. Good night, Lynn, good night, Letha and Fernandez, and see you late, later. Good see night, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.